we're going to uh, we're going to open God's Word, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 19. But before I get all serious, I dropped my daughter off at college this past week. Man, that's tough. I don't know if I, I, this empty nest. I've been looking forward to it being empty for a while, and now that it's empty, I'm like, what the heck? My wife has to put up with me all the time. You might be in prayer for her. She's going to need it. Anyway, driving my daughter off at of college, it made me think back to those days when I just got out of college, and you know, we had. Um, we had just got our first job and made no money, and, and we were so poor we couldn't pay the electric bills. I mean, we were so poor we couldn't even pay the electric bills. It was the darkest days of my life. Oh, come on, that's funny whether you like it or not. All right, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. Um, do you ever, do you ever, anybody in the room, you ever been lost? You ever been lost? And anybody in the room other than me ever been lost and didn't want to admit you were lost? Every guy, right? I know where we're going. Well, one day we were coming back from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. We were coming from Springfield, Missouri and through St. Louis. And we were headed and we made it through that maze called uh, St. Louis. And it was horrible. And we'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, we were, we were driving through and we get, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're making good time. We're making good time. And there's this Interstate 55 that it sort of splits and we weren't paying attention. And we took Interstate 55 north instead of staying on 70 west. And man, we were making good time. We were making great time. I'm driving down the road. Oh, let's, we're going fast. And, and we saw a sign. And, and I'm like, hey, hey, you know, we're on 55. <laughs> and we were making good time, but we were going in the. Uh, anybody ever done that? You're making good time, but you're going in the wrong direction. At some point, we have to be willing to say, y'all ready for this? I'm going the wrong direction. I'm lost. I didn't know I was lost, but I was. Anytime you're going where you shouldn't be going, you're what? Lost. Now, I was reading, um, I, I, I read stuff, and um, some of the articles I read online, you know, uh, they're Christian sites, and non-Christians show up. And, and one of the, the sites was talking about people who were lost, and, and there was a debate going on between a Christian and unchristian. And, um, and the uh, Christian said, well, you know, Jesus loves all the lost people. And, and somebody said, they came on and they popped on, and they said, you mean I'm lost? And they had an attitude about the fact that they were being called lost. You know, it's offensive, apparently, to tell people that are lost that they're lost. Right? All right, this is going to be a long sermon if y'all just sit there and look at me. So this Christian site, the site, this guy was saying, don't tell me I'm lost, even though Jesus came to seek and save the lost. We don't want to hear we're lost because there's something in us that says, you can't tell me anything about my life. I know better than you. Now, the Bible says this. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, and the end thereof is death. And there's God's way, and God's way is always better, and I, I trust it. Core value of my being, I trust that God's way is always better than my way. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Y'all ready for this? It's never proved wrong. All right? You want to talk about a way to live your life better than the way you're living it? Trust that what God says is right. And, and if you hang out long enough, eventually you'll run into the fact that God is right even when you don't think he is. Eventually you will run into that fact. So anyway, um, it's like the other day. I don't like being told I'm wrong. We don't like being told, you know, somebody tells you, you <laughs> your friends tell you he or she is wrong for you, and you're like, no, we're in love. Or your boss gives you instruction, and you're like, my boss is such a jerk, even though he was right. Our parents or kids tell us that we shouldn't dress in that, but we do it anyway. Or like my son said to me the other day, he said, Dad, you got to change your Twitter picture. I'm like, what? He said, it, you're young in your Twitter picture. <laughs> wow. 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 You know, there was a time when I started this church. I was 25. I was too young. And, and now I'm too old. And I don't know what day I was right to be the right age to be a pastor, but I was either too young for way too long. Maybe one day when I was 41, like one day, August 13th, when I was 41, I was the right age. But I don't know. I, I'm now too old. Then I was too young. Y'all ever notice that? And he tells me, your picture, you look too young. You need to change it. So I was like, no, I don't. And then I looked at it and I realized I need to change it because <laughs> I look young. Those doggone wrinkles. Anyway, 
since people often don't respond well to direct confrontation, telling them they're wrong, well, then what do we do? We believe that God's way is best, but yet people aren't living in God's way. So how do we, how do, we do this? Where we talk to people who get an attitude when you tell them you're wrong. Well, that's why we're looking at Luke chapter 19, verse 1. And I know you've stood a bit, but would you stand to your feet in honor of God's word? Luke chapter 19, starting verse 1. The story of a guy named Zacchaeus. And what we know about Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee man. He climbed up. No. For the Lord he wanted to see. Oh, about five or six of you know the song. The rest of you are either afraid or you're like, dude, they're butching this one. We need the band back. All right. So we know something about Zacchaeus, that Zacchaeus was what? Short. He was short. So, but that's about all we know about him. Let's look at the passage, though. Jesus entered Jericho and was what? Come on. He was what? He was passing through. So did Jesus intend to stay in Jericho? No. So the first thing we're going to find out about Jesus, and I'll just go ahead and say it up front, is that Jesus went out of his way to have a relationship with somebody that didn't even really know what a relationship with him meant. So Jesus was passing through. And a man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a, here's what we do know about him. He was chief tax collector. He wasn't just tax collector. He was what? Chief tax collector. And he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, everybody say the spot. When Jesus reached the spot, what did he do? He looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Hmm. So there's a spot that God has picked out to meet you. It's a spot that's there. And he's going to enter into that spot, and he invites you to it. So he came down at once and welcomed him daily, uh, gladly. And all the people saw this, and they began to mutter. Anybody mutter other than me? Anybody, anybody in the house, y'all mutter? Anybody else a mutter? You know what a mutter is, don't you? That's a person that flips you off beneath the seat of the car. Would never stick it up in the window for you to look at, but would do it underneath the seat. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The mutterer, mutter is a person that talks to the, he, the one that talks to the washing machine rather than talks to you. I hate mutter, mutterers. I am one. I hate mutterers. You know why mutters? Because you can never deal with somebody that's muttering. Mutterer, you can't say anything because they won't say it to your face. They'll only say it behind your back. <laughs> I don't like mutterers. You got something to say? Where should you say it? To the person you got a problem with, work it out. If you don't have guts enough to say it, it's probably because you shouldn't, so you should shut up muttering. Because if, if it ain't right to say to their face, it ain't right to say to their back. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say all that? I did, because I'm not a mutterer. I, don't, I try sometimes, and I don't want to be that guy. All right. He said he's going to be the guest of a sinner. Well, duh. If he goes to eat with anybody, he's going to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. Wow. And if I cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, Yo, dude. It, it's in there. He didn't maybe. It's not in your version. They smoothed it out for the Greek, but it's really there. Jesus looked at him and said, Yo, dude. Awesome. He said, Today salvation has come to this man's house because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. And then here's our sentence that we need. Y'all ready for this? The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So what did the son of man come to do? Seek and to save who? The lost. Even the ones who think they aren't lost. He came to seek and to save the lost. Father, I pray you'd give me an ability here for the next couple of moments to say things that would speak to our hearts appropriately, and I pray that we would listen and we would become the people of God you called us to be, and that we too would follow Jesus by seeking and saving those who are lost. Thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so there are three insights from the passage. I'm going to cover this quick. Y'all ready? This is the deadest crowd I have preached to in a long time. 
Come on, y'all got to help a brother out here. You got to say, somebody, practice this, practice this. Even if you don't believe in it, practice it anyway. Just say amen. Amen. Oh, wow. Now, if you do that, this sermon will shorten a long, long time. Y'all ready? <laughs> there you go. Three insights from the passage. Number one, don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on anybody. Now, Zacchaeus is an unlikely candidate for God's grace. He was not physically impressive. He was short, so he couldn't see over people. He had problems. He had issues. He had short guy complex, if you will. He never thought he was powerful, so he overpowered in business. And I know you've never run into anybody like that. And here's a guy, he's overpowering everywhere he goes. And he's a tax collector. Why is a tax collector reveal about his character? It reveals about his character. He was overpowering because he worked literally for the people who were oppressing his people. He was a, all right, imagine this. If there's somebody from, say, Russia that wants to take away our money and, and I don't know, Bob Hernandez here gets a job and starts taxing all of us and taking all of our money away to send it to Russia. How would we like Bob? We wouldn't. Because Bob would be a Benedict Arnold, right? Everybody understand a Benedict Arnold? This is the mentality we're talking about. He was a traitor to his own people by taking money for Rome and taxing people of Israel to send it to Rome. He was rich. How did he get rich? See the second thing. He was a tax collector. He actually stole from people to add to his own finances. But Zacchaeus had an inner tension that led him to want to see Jesus. Um, listen, can we talk for a sec? Good. Thank you. We'll talk. A lot of us think we've goofed up too much for God to love us. Think you've goofed up too much. Look at who Zacchaeus was. He was a long way from God. He was really goofed up. He was a goofed up human being who had making wrong decisions. He had made a lot of wrong decisions. He had done a lot of things that had led him away from what God's best for his life was. And because of that, he, was, he probably thought he was too goofed up to go talk to Jesus. So instead he hid in a tree. He wanted to see him, but he didn't want to get close. Because he thought he was too messed up. And I just want to tell you this. If you're somebody that you made a lot of mistakes, you made a lot of wrong turns, and you've been lost, and you've gone down wrong roads, and you think, you think that you're too far gone, you're not too far gone. Let me tell you a little illustration. A couple years ago, I was reading an article about AI, artificial intelligence. And there's this game, this Chinese game that they play. It's a, it's a game that's uh, like chess, except it's got like a thousand more moves per move, uh, like 370,000 possible moves per move on this board. And this artificial intelligence computer was programmed how to play the game. So they're playing the game against the world master. And the first game was sort of tight. The world master made all these moves. And as he made the moves, the computer responded and barely won. But they found something out in game two and three that the computer began to toy with the man because he learned after his first set of moves that the guy was predictable in how he moved and the computer had the algorithms and stuff to predict what his moves would be before he made him. So he toyed, the computer toyed with the guy and directed him into a loss when the computer wanted to make the loss happen, not when the guy, the guy was doomed from the first move. Now listen to this, listen, listen. If there's a computer that's a, able to process something and man can make up a computer like that, don't you think we have a God that's been around and is the knowledge of all the ages and he's seen everything you've done from the day you were born until now and he knows your habits and he knows your styles and he knows your patterns, he knows your ideas, he knows what you're gonna do before you do it because he played with you long enough to know what you're going to do and you think you're going to goof up your life so far that you can get so far that God's not one move away from redeeming you? No, he has planned every move so that when you're ready to reach the spot and you're willing to open your heart to him, he is ready to receive you because he's moved you your entire life. And every wrong move you made is just something that led you one step closer to finally being able to receive God as your Lord. So the only person who's gone too far is the dead person or the proud person person that won't admit they need God no matter what. And God's plan to spot says when Jesus reached the spot, God has a spot for you 
that he's chosen to meet you. And you know what? Notice that the spot was not in a church or a synagogue or anything like that. Where was the spot? It was on the road. Why do you think we take Harvest Palooza to the park? The reason we take Harvest Palooza to the park is so we can reach a spot because a lot of the people that will be there tonight would never, ever, ever come to a church. But you know what? Even though they won't come to a church, we ought to go to the road where they are because there's a spot there. And it might just be your smile, your act of love. Why are you guys doing this? Because we want you to know Jesus loves you. How about that? How about your response? Well, where can I give money? I hear that every year. Where can I give money to pay for this? No, 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 no. We're doing this to show you Jesus loves you regardless. We don't need your money. We're just here to show the love of Jesus. Can you talk like that? Well, if you can, there might be a spot in that park tonight where somebody encounters Jesus. Second thing we learn from this passage is we need to invite people into relationship. Jesus invited himself into relationship with Zacchaeus. Luke chapter nine, verse, uh, 19, verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come on down. I must stay at your house today. Notice how Jesus sort of reached into his world and said, I got to have dinner with you. You know that God is always inviting the broken into relationship. A lot of us think we got to get all straightened up before God's going to love us. But no, 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 no. You don't get all straightened up before God loves you. You come to God as goofed up as you are, and God will love you into the person you should be. Oh, you don't believe me. The prodigal son. What's the story of the prodigal son? You know, the prodigal son had ran away. He, was he all cleaned up and nice when the dad met him? No, he was still smelling like a pig in a mess. He was still a mess. He came back to Jesus and there Jesus showed him, uh, came back to the father as a symbol of God's love and, and God met him where he was at. How about every demon possessed person in the Bible? You ever met a demon possessed person? They're not coming to you going, I want to be delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in the Bible came and said, I want to be delivered. They were all coming going, ah, Jesus, what do you have to do with us? And Jesus says, come out. And Jesus met them where they were. He, they weren't delivered when they came to him. He delivered them after they came to him, right? Are y'all awake? You got that? How about this one? Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. Three times he denied him. What happened? Jesus made him breakfast. You read about it, John chapter 22, Jesus made him breakfast to restore Peter. Even though Peter denied him three times, Jesus went out of his way to show him love while he was still in that denial moment. How about Paul? Paul's hunting Christians, going to kill them. He's on the road to Damascus to kill Christians. Jesus comes along and says, no, bro, you're not doing this anymore. He meets Jesus. Jesus didn't wait until Paul stopped persecuting Christians. He met him where he was. The Bible says, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me tell you what this church is to be, all right? I got stories. I'm not going to tell you the stories. I, I talked to a girl yesterday or the other day, Friday. I spent some time talking to her. I got story. I got a quote. I got all that. Can I just throw all that aside and say this very, very quickly? This is a house and a space. This is a gathering of people where it is safe for you to be goofed up when you come in here. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything right. This is a church we invite you into relationship and there you can meet Jesus and there Jesus will put you on the path to life. This is a safe house. Right now, culture has made it safe to run away from God. I got a quote written by a girl. I'll just read you the quote. It's written by a girl who was caught in a, a lifestyle and, um, and she had wandered away from God and she became a follower of Jesus and she came back and she said this statement about the world right now. It is much easier now to find a safe place to go into the LGBTQ, and I would add S, straight, life, than it is to leave it. Right now, it is more socially acceptable to be LGBTQS than to be a Christian. It is safer on you emotionally to run there than it is to run to Jesus. And you know why? Because the church has done a real bad job of saying, I don't care what sin you're in, welcome home. We have a Jesus that will bring you to a relationship with him. Our message isn't so much that sin is bad. Anyone that's ever been in sin knows that. By the way, by the way, 
If you sin, the first time it's not fun, you didn't do it right. True? If you sin the first time you do it, it's not fun. You didn't do it right. That first relationship where you were in the backseat of the car and go too far, if it's not fun, you didn't do it right. But 15 other boys or girls later, when you don't even know how to relation, have a relationship with a person anymore because they're just a body, you find out that sin takes you where you don't want to go and destroys the very things God has intended for your life. Right? That first drink, if you don't get a buzz off your first drink, you're not alive. But when you're an alcoholic and you lose your job, come on, your family, everybody walks away from you. You realize that sin starts somewhere and where it winds up is not where it started. Sin's always fun to begin with. Do you know that, right? Y'all all realize that. That's temptation. If sin's not fun the first time, then you didn't do it right. Are y'all awake, alive? But eventually, what happens if you continue to follow your path of sin? Eventually, what happens? Death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. God knows that eventually, if you follow your own passions, not God's will for your life, if you follow your own passions, eventually, you will wind up destroying you and every person you love. If you don't believe that, just let me talk to you for a bit about the counseling I've done over the last 30 years as a pastor. It starts fun, it leads to destruction. So my message to teenagers is, yeah, it's fun. But you know what? Smart people realize, smart people realize that if you continue to follow a way of death, it will destroy you. But if you discipline yourself, you're going to enjoy that for a whole lot longer. So my message to all of us is not, no, sin so bad, sin so bad. No, no. My answer is this. My answer is that God has a better plan for your life than you have for your life. That's a predisposition I have in my life. I was talking to somebody about this stuff this week, and I have a predisposition. And do you know why I have this predisposition? Because I've lived a couple of days on this earth, and every time I think I'm smarter than God, do you know what winds up happening? It gets proved that I'm wrong, I'm lost, and God knows where he's going. Eventually it does. Oh, I can lease a car, it's not a problem. Yeah, and until you give up the lease and then you got to pay more money at the end. And then you have nothing to put on your next car. That's why God's word says that the borrower is what? Slave to the lender. That's the reason we have FPU here every year. I want what's better for you. God wants what's better for you. And you're lost. And you're saying, don't tell me I'm lost. I know what I'm doing. No, no, no. Why don't we just simply open up the fact that God loves us and wants us to have a way out? So our job as Christians is not to yell at people, but to invite them. And I want to invite you into a better life. Into a better life. A life where Jesus is your Lord and you do it his way. And that's what we're here to do as believers. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Yeah, God is talking to you through this knot-headed preacher today. He wants you to accept his way, not the socialized way of our culture. Why? Because we're asking you, we're imploring you. Implore means beg, strongly beg. We're imploring you on God's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So you don't even have to pay for it. He's going to cover it. So that we might become the righteousness of God. And and how do we do this? We do this this way. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So how do we do this? We do this by us getting in relationship with each other. If you truly get in relationship with Christians, with people who are followers of Jesus, you're going to be encouraged and strengthened to follow Jesus. So in this place, we want you to go to life groups. We want you to be a part of the body. We make our appeal through each other. Listen to me. If you've got a choice to go to your small group, your life group, or you've got a choice to come to Sunday morning to listen to me talk, I want you to go to the life group group because you learn better in circles than you do in rows 
I want you to be in your small group. So together we will have a place where we invite you into relationship with God. And then last thing, let Jesus do his thing. Notice how Zacchaeus immediately responded to Jesus' mercy. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. Wow, what a day. Could you imagine that salvation? Hi, I'm going to give half my possessions away. That guy got saved. I, I got no question. That guy fully got saved. Half of what I own, I gave it away. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. This dude is going to be in the bread line asking for bread like everybody else. But he didn't quit his job. And I wonder how this job looked from now on. How did Zacchaeus himself become a man who was honoring God with his life and not ripping people off, but yet was a tax collector and yet serving the very people? God did such a work in his life that he made an impact on his culture for months and years to come. What an amazing thought. I've thought about this. Man, he rejected all his stuff. He rejected money. He repented. And you know what Jesus commanded him to do in this passage? Look at it. Nothing. Jesus didn't make a single demand on him. And yet this guy volunteered these changes. Why? Because he already knew what he needed to do. We have this thing in us called a conscience and it's alive. And we, we may sear it. We may, we may like uh, scab it over. Anybody ever have a scab? I got a big scar right here and you can touch it and I not feel anything because it's a scar. And a lot of us, you know, we'll sin, we'll sin, we'll sin. And we create a scar so that when the Holy Spirit starts trying to mess with us and we touch it, there's no feeling. You know why there's no feeling? Because we've deadened ourselves to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We've scabbed our heart over and, and we've deadened it. You know, if you've ever burned yourself, you lose feeling where you burn really bad. You know, there's no feeling. I can't feel that. You know why? Because I burned it really bad when I was a kid. And if you've been burned by the world and your sin, sometimes you you don't, you can't even feel it. And the Holy Spirit though, will, will do this. This is what will happen. The Holy Spirit will start talking to you and, and dealing with you about things that you're saying, no, no, no. And the Holy Spirit inside saying, come on, come on. You know, you know, you know. And when, when Jesus shows up in your life, you're going to go all of a sudden, you know, can you imagine Zacchaeus his entire life defending himself as a tax collector? We get a right to do this. You know, people don't treat me right. They never treat me right. Therefore, I have a right to take their money. Can you imagine the mentality? Come on. Am I talking to people who are alive this morning? Do you ever do this? You ever justify your bad behavior? You get all scarred over. You don't, you don't feel like it. And then all of a sudden you come in contact with God and you're like, oh, I got to change this. And then you're, I know what you are. You're lost and you don't want to admit you're lost. You're like, no, no, no. The reason I don't have to change it is because of this. And all the while, God's saying to you, no, come on, come on, come on, come on. What happens is, here's here's this. Harvest Ridge exists to be a place where we can introduce people to the life-changing power of Jesus for current and coming generations. That's our statement of mission. You know why? Because we know if you ever really, really encounter Jesus, you will never be the same. You know, why don't we preach tonight at Harvest Palooza? Why don't we stand up and preach and tell them whatever? I'll tell you why. I went to a Billy Graham crusade. Anybody remember Billy Graham Graham being here? And he was in Cleveland. I went to the crusade. And I go there, and I'm like, I listen to the sermon. And, man, the sermon was so simple. I mean, I'm not even sure it was an adequate presentation of the full gospel. It was just a simple, very simple 20-minute presentation of the gospel in in. English and language that if you weren't born and raised in church, you didn't understand. And I'm sitting there in the crowd thinking, this guy, nothing's going to happen. And I was amazed when they started playing just as I am and people started flooding by the thousands forward to get saved. We, we have people literally a part of our church that gave their hearts to Christ at that event. And I'm sitting in, in the stands there going, the effect is not equal to the presentation. But you know what Billy Graham did that was so amazing? He simply shared that Jesus loves you and Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And a bunch of people prayed, and guess what happened? When they encountered Jesus in that moment, people gave their hearts to Jesus. Do you know what we want to do at Harvest Palooza? We simply want to say Jesus loves you. You know what we want to do at Harvest Ridge? We want to introduce you to Jesus. I walk up and down these aisles. Every week I walk through this church and I pray that while you're sitting there, you wouldn't simply come to church, 
But you would meet Jesus Christ in a powerful way, and you would never, ever be the same. And listen, I can't talk you into that, but right now the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart, and Jesus is saying, hey, this is the spot. This is the time. Come to me. That's what we do. So we're going to go be the spot. So, you know, there are some guidelines if you want to, uh, if you want to not be lost. <laughs> All right. So do y'all remember back in the day before we had phones, smartphones? Does anybody remember that? Anybody in the room wave at me? You remember before we had them? They had these things if you needed to drive from point A to point B and Siri didn't talk to you and tell you everything to do. do you, does anybody remember this? They, they had these things on the road called what? There were signs, literally, literally, there were signs. Y'all, y'all ready? So you would get in your car and there would be a sign that would say, go to St. Louis or head west. And you know you could follow west to get St. Louis, right? Now, we've been through St. Louis several times and St. Louis is a maze. I'll use it as an example because it was, it was horrible. It's a maze. You pull into town, there are roads going everywhere and it is a mess. It's, to me, downtown St. Louis on the east side is as bad as any place I've ever driven in my life. And I've driven a lot of crazy places. And I've used Siri the last dozen times I've went through St. Louis and I've gotten lost every single time. They give you the road to take one too late or whatever it is and you're driving through and you take the wrong turn. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, because I'm aggressive and if you tell me to turn right, I'm turning right now. (laughs) Don't tell me, right? In 14 miles. No! Anyway, anyway, I'm driving through and Siri's direct and I've gotten lost now like, my wife can verify this. I've gotten lost like 15 times. This time, we're driving through St. Louis to go to Springfield, and I said, I will not, I will not turn that stupid woman on tell me what to do. <laughs> or the Australian guy, either one, whichever one you have on yours. I will not listen to that guy. I don't care. So you know what I did? Y'all ready for this? I knew that if you go to St. Louis downtown, if you get to St. Louis, as you're going into town, you can take Interstate 44 to the direction you want to go. Are y- y'all ready for this? So I followed the signs that said St. Louis. And if there was a sign that said St. Louis, downtown St. Louis, do you know what I did? I followed that sign. It was right up there in front of me. I didn't even have to look down. And and check this while I run into somebody. I could literally see the sign while I was driving and it'd say St. Louis this way. And you know what I did? I drove St. Louis that way. And, And I got downtown and I'm right there in downtown and I'm getting tense. Like, where do I go? Where do I go now? Where do I go now? Where do I go now? And all of a sudden there was a sign that said 44. And you know what I did? I took 44. There was a sign right in front of me. Now, a lot of us, we want signs to get to Pomona, California, and we want it leaving Cleveland. God, show me where I should go. And you know what? He'll give you the sign when you need it, but you don't need the sign until you're where you need to make the turn. So there is a spot and there's a place and there's a direction. If you'll follow the signs, you won't get lost. When I was a kid, I was hunting in the woods back in Oklahoma. And, and um, I, I, my ADHD, me with the rifle in the woods and ADHD, it was a really scary thing. But here I was, I'm in the woods, so I sit down, about 10 minutes, no deer comes by because of my, so I've got to walk, and I get up and walk, I never saw a deer all my childhood walking through the woods, because I wonder why, I mean, the ADHD was, I'm little counting squirrels and all this stuff. Anyway, I get, I get to walk in, and I'm walking around, and I realize I got dropped off at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I realize about 8.30, oh, crud, I don't know where I am anymore. I thought I was headed back to camp, so I could go back and, and play on the trees and ride them over and anyway, but I couldn't do that. So you know what I did? I, they told me when we went hunting out there, they said, if you get lost, go downhill until you get to the river and then follow the river downstream till you get to the bridge. And when you get to the bridge, you can follow the logging road back up to our camp. I left at 7 a.m. in the morning. I figured out I was lost about nine o'clock in the morning and I arrived back at camp at nine o'clock at night because I walked downhill to the river. Apparently I'd gotten really lost. I walked downhill to the river, followed the river to the, to the road, the logging road, followed the logging road back to camp. And I didn't stay lost even though I was lost because I followed the signs. If you want to know where Jesus is, I'm going to tell you where the signs are. Y'all ready for this? 
It's in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 7. Tell me, you who graze the flock, where you rest your sheep at midday. If you do not know, if you don't know where the sheep are, what do you do? Follow the tracks of the sheep. And when you find, follow the tracks of the sheep, when you find the sheep, there you will find the shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and my sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. If you're lost, what do you do? You follow the tracks of the sheep. Who are the sheep? Jesus said, my sheep are here. You follow the tracks of the sheep until you run into the shepherd. If you don't know how to find Jesus, follow the signs. Follow the tracks of the sheep until you encounter the shepherd. And how do you do that? You do that in a church. One final thing, and then we're done. We're going to pray. We're going to have celebrate communion. Um, if you're going like one of my not-headed children did, they took off to go to Akron, but they got on the turnpike headed west. And I got a phone call, said, Dad, why am I in Sandusky? <laughs> I'm like, you're in Sandusky because you went the wrong way. Now, what do they have to do? Just get back on, keep driving, keep driving west? Will they ever wind up at Akron if they head west? No. What do they have to do? They have to turn around. Do you know what that turnaround's called? Repentance. So when you see the sign that God wants to save you, he wants to turn you, what do you need to do? You need to repent and turn around. Come back to him. It's that simple. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a second. Let's say a prayer. Before we say that prayer, though, are you in the place today? Come on. I, I had planned on preaching this different, but I stood up to preach, and the Holy Spirit started speaking to me that there are some of you here. You're just as lost as you can be. You're making excuses. Come on. You, are, you know it. The Holy Spirit right now is talking to you. This isn't me. That thing going on in your spirit right now is the Holy Spirit. And he's talking to you, and he's saying, today is your day. Come on. This is the spot to meet me you know you're lost and you want to turn around and you want to receive Jesus as your savior right now if that's you I'd like you to raise your hand I want to pray with you right now in this room that's you come on Holy Spirit's talking to you and you know it just raise your hand I want to pray with you come on you know you're lost excuse it all you want to, but it's not working, is it? Okay, Father, I pray that you would speak to those in this place today that are lost. Tell them that you love them. You paid the penalty for their sin a long, long time ago. You're not trying to beat them up. You just want to give them a life. And I pray that they would receive and respond to it. Receive communion today. Those serving communion are coming.